historically hunters were traditional hunters. They grew up in a family of hunters, and so they became hunters. And now we have a lot of people who didn't grow up in hunting families, but they want to begin hunting. What brought me back to hunting was food. You know, the idea that, yeah, you know, that it is, you know, it is local, it's, it is sustainable. Coming up on a, a big bull or a, some cows, and all of a sudden they disappear, and how does an 800-pound creature just vanish? All the guns in the corner of my room. I'm nine years old, you know, and this is your granddaddy's shotgun, you know. This is Hal Herring with the uh, Backcountry Hunters and Anglers podcast and blast. Um, we're up here on a real smoky day at the Boone and Crockett Ranch. In Theodore, it's Theodore Roosevelt Ranch, right? Yes, sir. Um, and uh, we're out of Depuyer, Montana, way back on the front here. Um, we're talking with uh, Trey Curtis, Sawyer Connolly, and Jim Geezy. And they're going to introduce themselves because they know more about themselves than I know about them. Um, and uh, I'm, this is a great part of the world right in here. I know everybody is, we got a lot to talk about. Um, Jim, you're going to leave a little bit early, right? Because you got duties here. That's right. Yep. But, um, we'll, so we'll get started. Uh, Trey, how about telling me what you, what you do and how you got here? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I'm the Collegiate Curriculum and Outreach Coordinator for Backcountry Hunters and Anglers. Um, it's a fellowship. Uh, split between BHA and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, I interned for BHA when I was at University of Montana for just under two years. I uh, graduated this past May and a few weeks later started full-time with BHA. Cool. And I know you're uh, known as the king of the elk hunters at the moment, so we'll <laughs> talk about that in a minute. Um, and uh, Sawyer, talk about it and tell me where you are, man. Yeah, I'm Sawyer Connolly. Uh, I work as a campus outreach coordinator with BHA. Um Found my way out west for college, fell in love um, with the western landscapes, public lands, started hunting, kind of consumed me, and um, throughout college realized I wanted to get into conservation. So uh, post-graduation, had a short stint, uh, very humbling stint, chasing Atlantic salmon in Norway, came back to Denver, and I saw the job with BHA, applied, didn't know a soul in Missoula, but got the job, moved up here, and I've been loving it. Also moved up here from where? Uh, from Denver. Gotcha. Right on. And you'd already, you already started hunting down there in Colorado? I, I had. I hunted uh, for five years in college, um, very unsuccessfully, but learned a lot. Yeah. You were telling me you are 26? Yeah. And Trey, how old are you? 23. 23. And uh, we got Jim Geezy here, who's kind of organized this thing where we're at. Um, and uh, I want to let him introduce himself and talk about cause what, what you're doing one of the more interesting things I've come up on a um, long time, I, when you were telling me that I knew right away this was a, gra- a g- great opportunity. So tell me something about it. I appreciate that. Yeah, so I'm Jim Geezy. Um, so I came up with this program when I was in grad school at the University of Montana. And I, I went into grad school, grad school knowing that I was going to be writing about writing, or writing about hunting. And by doing that, I came across you know the, a similar program in Wisconsin. And so I wrote a grant proposal and, you know, it was for a graduate seminar. And when I got done with the graduate seminar, I sort of, I was excited to see the excitement of, you know, students within the class and how, you know, they were looking for an avenue, to, you know, to get into hunting. Yeah. You know, and a lot of them were, um, you know, as an environmental studies major, you know, a lot of them were in, in environmental studies field and just had never had the opportunity to, you know, be introduced to hunting, you know, to, um, you know, they didn't did not grow up around hunters. Right. Um, and so when I wrote up this grant proposal, as I said, I was really excited about the interest, you know, and be, and to be perfectly honest, I was expecting, you know, a little bit of backlash, you know, that, you know, cause it was about hunting, right. but rather the you know, the interest in, you know, particularly local sustainable foods was really driving that interest in hunting. Okay. So, um, tell me something about, okay. The environmental studies program, it, it, the University of Montana mm-hmm. is, is where you were at. Correct. All right. So when you said you thought it might be a backlash, what is the what is the uh, what what kind of folks are in that program? You know, I mean, I've been an environmental reporter for almost mm-hmm. twenty years. That's what drew me to to writing to nonfiction writing. Mm-hmm. So I'm always fascinated. Who are my fellow environmentalists, and what do they think? You right. know, or your conservationists, and what do they classify? What what is the What's the ambience of that program? Who's in there that's interested in hunting and they're in environmental studies in Montana right now? Right. Who is it? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely an eclectic group. Um, you know, the, the you know, the, the whole food movement, I mean, a huge, you know, a huge portion of the graduate students in that program and the undergrad students 
you know, they're definitely looking at local sustainable foods, you gotcha. know, and without a doubt. And, you know, they're, I'm not going to throw any percentages out there and stuff, but, you know, it's a large part of this. No, yeah, I'm looking for general. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, environmental writing is another large part of it, which is, you know, the avenue I took yeah. know, as well. Um, environmental policy, you know, is another avenue as well. Um, but I think for me, um, you know, what really attracted me to it, I've got a background, you know, I've got a degree in wildlife ecology and a degree in writing. And, you know, this program to me melded, you know, the science right. and you the bet. writing behind it. So it, that's what took me or brought me to that program. Right. And um, so the, your fellow students that you knew were interested in hunting and all, what, what are, what are their, what are their ideas? Who are they? Well, I mean, that, and that's there to me, that's the ironic part. I, I went into it expecting there to be zero interest in hunting. If, you know, I'll be honest, you know, if anything, you know, it was sort of a backlash against it, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, and it was, you know, preconceived notions on my part, you know, and stuff uh -huh. too, you know, I, you know, I, I know, you know, and I knew of some environmental studies students and other programs, um, you know, and those that I knew were, you know, I don't want to say anti-hunting, but definitely not against, you know, definitely against hunting. Uh -huh. um, so I went into the program knowing I was going to be writing up about hunting and the, you know, even through those writings, I was excited to see the interest. Mm -hmm. You know, and then, you know, as I said, then I developed a grant proposal here. And after I got done with this, this course, this seminar, the number of people came to me and said, came to me and said, you need to develop this, you know, uh -huh. with, within the environmental studies program, right, right? you know, and even, and there was some environmental lawyers, you know, within that graduate seminar and stuff, and they, you know, supported it as well. And, you know, I sort of, be honest, but first off, I sort of blew it off and I said, oh, I'm not so sure if that's, you know, feasible or not. Yeah. I think I looked it more into it. I talked to you know, Keith Warnke, who's the coordinator in Wisconsin for uh, the DNR there, and, you know, sort of bent his ear about it. And he said, you know, you should approach us and, you know, let's just see what happens. You know, what's the worst going to, you know, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen? Right. Um, you know, I talked about funding and, you know, he went through, you know, the, some of the federal avenues for doing it, some of the state avenues for doing it. And then, you know, I became familiar with BHA and I said, you know, this this organization really sounds like somebody who may support this. And so I contacted land and we met at draft works over beer and he said, yeah, this sounds great. Yeah. And so he really helped getting that ball rolling okay. you know, and getting the program going. So, so I saw some of your reading list and whatnot, but tell me what, uh, so, so what do you do in a concrete way in, uh, in this? Uh, I mean, you know, again, the idea here is, you know, to use food to introduce people to hunting, you know, that's know. the gist of it. And it's not to say, you know, we still talk about, you know, the normal, you know, the normal things you'd find in a hunter's ed course, you know, as well. You yeah. know, we'll do a firearm safety program and a, a range program tomorrow. Uh, we, you know, we talk about ethics. We talk about wildlife management, the purpose of it, you know, as well. Um, but we also, you know, every meal is cooked with, you know, donated game, you yeah. know, which has been great. Yeah. First year we did it, we did one meal um, with a deer that was killed on the ranch. Um, we're hoping to do that again this year. Yeah. You know, it's... um you know, it's hunting, you know, so as we all know, it doesn't always go as planned. Right. You know, but we're, you know, people are still trying, yeah. um, you know, and that's a big, you know, it's a big portion of the program. And based on feedback from last year, you know, the, the field dressing, butchering, you know, processing, butchering and stuff was, you know, a huge component to it. Yeah. You know, but I, th I also think that the idea that, you know, you don't get a deer has value. Yeah. You know, and stuff, you know, it teaches that hunting is, you know, it's not always... You know, it's a su successful, or it's not always a kill that makes it makes it successful. So, right, gotcha. Yeah, well, but, I, I was I enjoyed talking. I I did the talk earlier on on the like the origins of conservation and restoration of game with those with the students. And there's what thirty people here. We've got twenty students. Twenty and students up from five yeah. last year, so that's uh -huh. great. And we had a wait list this right. year. You know, the um, which is great. I mean, it's great to see those numbers. And this is an eclectic bunch too. Right. Um. I know there's writers and there's biologists and uh, mm -hmm. wildlife biologists that want to hunt that never have, which right. I, I was I was amazed by that. Right. And I and uh, they, I, I will say though it's a fit looking crew yeah. of young yeah. people that must mm -hmm. be drawn to this. And I, I mean, right. they're um, mostly they look ready to go hit the country. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and they are from different majors, which, which you know definitely you know within natural resources as well. But um, you know, there's a microbiology geography major, right? 
a journalism student, you know, yeah. which is nice to see. Right, you know, some creative it, writing too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mason, I talked to, um, and it's and it's it looks to be almost equally split, male and female, on this and this. Yeah, right now we're twelve females and eight eight males. So gotcha. yeah, so that's perfect. And yeah, you know, we, we you know. Personally, I like to see that. You know, I think right. it's interesting to see. And, and I don't know when this podcast is coming out, but I just talked with Hannah Jean Ryan and a, a 19-year-old gal named Liza Salter, mm-hmm. who's a very successful elk hunter and um, is steeped in the blood of it all. You know, Liza mm-hmm. is. And we talked about, like, like the they're, they they don't really work as women hunters, quote mm-hmm. unquote, with the air quotes around it. They're just hunters. You know, both of them are very successful. Yeah. But they uh, there is the idea that it's more difficult for um, women to get into hunting, mm-hmm. especially if in, um, she was talking about how Liza was teaching uh, hunter safety mm-hmm. and to have a 19 year old woman teaching it, all these single mothers were comfortable coming and bringing their children who did not have a mentor. And so there was a whole new bunch interest in it really of, of people who felt comfortable, mm-hmm. um, which I, I can't be anything but good. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. So where do you see what's, what's next for you? Uh, I mean, you know, talking to uh, Trey and Sawyer, you know, they, you know, the, their plan, which I, you know, support wholeheartedly. It's great. You know, their plan is to take this, you know, you know, expand it within Montana, expand it beyond Montana, right. you know, and you know, take it, you know, as far as they can. And to me, I mean, I couldn't ask for anything better. I mean, that's just, you know, it's it's ideal from my perspective as far as, you know, the reason why I started, you know, looking into this program. Yeah. And one of the reasons why I approached BHA. I mean, I really did feel that they had you know it is the opportunity to make it go somewhere yeah you know? yeah what um so what is your motivation when you when you were doing this i know you just you saw an inter- a need i guess yeah i, I mean one of I, mean, I didn't i didn't start hunting until i was probably 26 okay you know, and stuff and you know getting into it you know that you know adult onset hunter you know that has yeah. it's been tagged you know i went into it i made mistakes you know it was it was, it was enjoyable you know but i just remember the frustrations having no idea you yeah. know, what I was doing, yeah. you know, and so that, you know, I came up from it from that, from that perspective, you know, saying, okay, you know, I had not hunted when I was younger. Right. Um, it was well, also, you also then had a pretty good idea of where the, where the gaps were, right? I did. Yeah. yeah. I, and part of what drove that gap for me is, um, you know, I stopped, I actually, I mean, I stopped hunting when I was, when I turned probably 40 or 41 mm-hmm. and I'm not sure why. I mean, you know, I can't, pinpoint it and i stopped hunting for about seven years uh-huh. and when i got back into grad school and stuff and started looking into things you know and i think that's another thing that triggered this idea for me is what brought me back to hunting was food you know the idea that, that yeah you know that it is you know it is local it's it is sustainable right you know and it, it is i've always had a you know, I was, i'm a former restaurant owner as well so i've always had connection with food yeah and so to me it was just a great way to make that connection again you know with food via hunting you yeah. know, and stuff too. And, and I think the timing's right, you know, for the local food movement, you know, local for whatever you want to call it, you know, that, yeah. You know, and I don't care what people call it. Right. I mean, and it's a, it's a positive deal. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I was, we were talking about this last week too. And I, in, in Alabama where I grew up, there's a local, it, it has such good small farms mm-hmm. and there's a local food movement there. And people never quit hunting whitetails there. You know, the limits they want a day if you, if you have a place to hunt. But um, it it's been so positive, like in Alabama, as far as getting better food all the time. Right. And it's just, I just see no. I, I love talking about it now, um, mm-hmm. just because it's just it's a it's a, a a very positive thing that's happened within my last decade or two. Right. You mm-hmm. know, and um, so what? Uh, and, and you have a goal to expand this to other universities, and yeah, and then you know, you know, and, and I guess. You know, it's always sort of one of my goals to see it expand, you know, and then and Sawyer and Trey came to me and said, you know, we, we want to expand this. And, right. you know, it's sort of a hidden goal. And when they came up, you know, and then when they told me that, it was like, you know, this is just perfect. I mean, yeah. you know, that there's nothing any, I mean, it cannot be any more ideal, in my opinion, for this program to get expanded and for, you know, for BHA to take the reins. And, and where do you, it. where do you put, like, like, where did y'all find this bunch here, this 20 folks? Uh, I mean, this would be. You know, some of the typical promotion, we put posters out, um, some tabling events and everything too. We, you know, this year we opened it up to Montana State um, students as well. You know, last year it was just University of Montana. Um, the, you know, BHA chapters, you know, within MSU and UM obviously yeah, gotcha. played a big role, you know, yeah. as well. So, wow. Um, so, um, Sawyer, I know you were talking about ex- the expansion of, of all of this. 
Yeah. Um, and that's what that's a role that y'all are going to play. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was uh, just captivated by the program. I think mainly because I could have really used this program in college. Yeah. Um, I, as I said, grew up back east, fished a lot, but when I came out west for college, uh, my best friend and I decided we want to start hunting for food and just, it, it was a new way for me to engage with the landscape. I, I climbed, I biked, I skied. Um, but it, it, I found by hunting, I, it gave me something that I couldn't find in, through these other forms of recreation. And, uh, we, we taught ourselves, we didn't have any mentors. We'd go and geek out and read these biology papers about elk <laughs> migration. Yeah. And, um, yeah. We're very unsuccessful. Uh, and so seeing this program and seeing the opportunities that these students have, I, you know, I just fell in love with the program and the setting couldn't be better. Yeah. Um, and so when Trey came on board, we were able to work into his work plan, uh, that he would put about a third of his time to expanding these programs, uh, to our other collegiate clubs ar around the West and eventually right. beyond and creating a fishing version too. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I know there's a lot of people that want to fish, and and but yeah, what, is it a, is the fishing part? Is that fly fishing or just any kind of fishing? I think we're going to expand it to all types of fishing. Yeah, I would. Yeah. <laughs> My rule with uh, teaching little kids to fish is you need to catch stuff, and it's a we usually hit the Missouri River, you know, with night crawlers and a and a bottom rig, and then boy, you're catching stuff, and then and they're hooked. Whereas I've watched people try to give it to the fly fishing world is an esoteric world, you know. It's beautiful. I love it. I, I, we did some ten cara fishing. That's incredible too. But I, I, I damn sure wouldn't start somebody on a ten cara rod and you know delicately hoisting the dry fly. Um, but I think that's. I think there's a huge hunger for fishing like that. And and it, fishing is frustrating when you're when you're un, untutored in it and have no mentor. I mean, it's totally. It's 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 not as intense as hunting because you're not pulling the tr trigger of a lethal weapon trying to take down you know 200 pounds of meat. But it's 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 just as it's just as frustrating in that way, you know. So um, so back to Jim. Um, if uh, if this was a a tremendous success, what would it look like? Um, I mean, just the. Or we, I can say when this becomes a tremendous success in your mind. It's, <laughs> yeah. But it's in your mind. What what does it look like? What does success look like to you? I mean, right now, I think. I mean, right now, I think it is successful. You yeah. Know, just because we've gotten the word out, and you know, they just seen the expansion and in interest. You know, from year one to year two. But I mean, looking down, you know, looking down the road, without a doubt, to me, I mean, seeing it in multiple, you know, and it doesn't have to be widespread, you know, countrywide, but multiple campuses mm -hmm. across, you know, the U.S. Um, you know, even within the region, but moving beyond the region, you know, yeah. I think that to me, that'd be, you know, more than successful. Yeah. So, and definitely, and, you know, for me, it'd be fun to, you know, see how many hunters, you know, we have helped to create, Yeah. you know, and if that's, that could be a model of success as well. You know, if we can, you know, you know find a way to figure that out. Yeah. You know, and stuff too. Some, maybe some people who come at it, um, in in their teen in their in their college years, in particular, might even have you're not carrying that old baggage, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I started out really young, and of course, you when you're a kid, you hunt with people who don't they don't do it right, right? So you learn you 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 can learn bad habits and bad stuff. So maybe maybe this is another way to to create a a, a constituency of 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 people who came to it for out of a out of some passion of their own rather than just born into it mm -hmm. um i think that's really that's an interesting question you we know you and i talked about that a little bit sawyer well I, yeah i just want to to follow up what jim said about the, the measuring success we had a student yesterday who she talked about she really wanted to take this program to kind of see she has these ideals and hunting kind of fits into those ideals um but she's not sure if, if hunting's right for her and she's trying to figure right. out where that line is. But she's doing this to learn about hunting so she can talk as an advocate for hunting um, because it aligns with that ideal system. And so even if we don't generate a new new hunter out of it, but right. someone who understands, I think that's that's a great success too. Yeah, I do too. I mean I mean that did that's all I mean that's that's deep right there. Right? It doesn't matter if they're a field, 
you know, running through the woods with their bow or whatever, if, if they understand, like we were talking about earlier today, the idea of the hunter as inhabitant of landscape, you know, and we're, we, and whether we know it or not, we're all inhabitants of landscape. If you live in a penthouse in Manhattan, you're still an inhabitant of landscape because your water comes from the Adirondacks and your fish comes from the ocean, you know, and yeah. your vegetables have to be grown in dirt somewhere. Um, so and one of the things I like to think of in, in when I was reading their, your stuff and just talking to you was that, that it's a it's a reconnection whether 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 you become a hunter or not it's a reconnection with with a, a very much a reality you know um i just and i, I just don't see any downside to having a reality based uh worldview <laughs> <laughs> um That's for sure <laughs> so jimmy did you or uh you said you left hunting for a while but uh what kind of hunting do you do what's your what's your thing i know i met your lab yeah yeah definitely yeah. i'm definitely more of a bird hunter um, then I'm a big game hunter. Um, you know, growing up in Wisconsin, you know, you know, the deer culture in Wisconsin is obviously pretty well, pretty well rooted. Yeah. It's also um, nationwide. I run into um, real Wisconsin hunters in every state and every, mm -hmm. if you, if you go outside to talk about anything, anywhere, there's somebody from Wisconsin who grew up hunting. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and, you know, my dad hunted growing up, you know, so, I mean, we were exposed to it, but I, um, you know, I spent most of my teenage years living overseas, you know, mm -hmm. so we didn't have the opportunity and, you know, went to college after that. Um, but I've always been, you know, you know, I've, I've been drawn to bird hunting, you know, I like, mm -hmm. you know, the, I like the dog work, you know, that definitely is yeah. a huge part of it to me and yeah. stuff too, you know, since coming, you know, moving to Montana, you know, I have taken up elk hunting and stuff and, you know, glad to say, you know, first year I was out, I was, you know, successful, you know, got my first cow elk, so I'd have you know, have that under my belt. Yeah, that's pretty, that's a, a pretty good percentage yeah. right there. Yeah. And then went out the next year and saw absolutely nothing. Yeah. So, you know, and that's, you know, part of it as well. So what part of the state you hunt? Um, the, I, I live in the Bitterroot Valley, so I do some hunting there. Also do some hunting just outside of Phillipsburg. Gotcha. And stuff, so. Yeah. Yeah. And then the first year was outside of Dillon. So I'm sort of <laughs> moving my way back to home. Right. You know, Mashing trying to get around some Southwest. Right. 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 Yeah. Yep. Oh. What what about you, Sawyer? What part of the state, what part of the Rockies do you go to? Oh, well, now I go to Missoula. I, I started, uh, I went to school down Front Range of Colorado, and yeah. um, I ran all over the state there, t hunted a different unit probably every year and never really got to know a place, which could have been why I wasn't so successful. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's, it's since coming up to um, Missoula, uh, hunted around there, I've been really fortunate to have some great mentors at BHA, uh, Trey being one of them, and he was there when I killed my first buck last year, which was well, a pretty awesome experience. Um, mule deer or whitetail? Whitetail. Nice. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, uh, I, I love it. And the, there, there's no shortage of uh, areas to hunt in the yeah. state. Yeah. Or anywhere in the West. Right. Yeah. So, Trey, in your, your country? Uh, I like to travel a lot. I, I, you know, I like to change it up quite a bit and go to different places throughout the season, but I'd say mostly. West Central Montana mm -hmm. uh, region too, mm -hmm. and you were so. Um, I know they're you're riding pretty high right now after killing a big bull early in, early in the heat and the and the early season. Yeah, and uh, we'll let's, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, while Jim's still here, um, what brought you? What's your background in this? And not just in this sustainability thing, but just in general. How do you get here? With to, BHA, yeah, with BHA into this spot we're sitting in. Okay, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I um, was taking a class at UM a few years ago. Uh, one of my professors, Alex Metcalf, uh, kind of reached out to everybody and asked if we wanted to do internships. And so one day after class, he, you know, we were sitting there talking, and uh, he asked where I'd like to intern. I was like, you know, I really like what Backcountry Hunters and Anglers is doing. Um, and I think he sent me an email the next morning. It was like, you have an interview with Lantani on Thursday. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> and so that was uh, the day I interviewed was Sawyer's first day. Yeah. Um, and so I helped develop the first uh, collegiate club at UM, presided over that for a year and a half. Collegiate um, club being of BHA. Yep. Gotcha. Yep. Um, so, yeah, just stuck around. And then it just happened that as I was graduating, uh, my position opened up and um, ended up filling right into that one um, yeah and that's you know of of my position part of it is expanding this hunting for sustainability outside of montana yeah um, did you so, come into it for as a, as a long time elk hunter yeah so i think i come into it from a more traditional uh role um 
I grew up, I think I started hunting with my dad when I was five and got right into it when I was 12. Yeah. Um, Where were you? It was in Missoula. Mm-hmm. Um, my family had a cattle ranch between Drummond and Phillipsburg, Montana. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Um, on Flint Creek? Yep. yep. Yeah. 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 Yep. Um, so yeah, from, uh, from there, um, I think. In the, ne- in the next year, we plan to expand this beyond Montana to Idaho, Wyoming, and Colorado, um, possibly Nevada and Alaska, and gotcha. then this next spring do a fishing for sustainability in Montana. Yeah, cool. And when you're uh, – do you do instruction as well, or is that Jim's – You know, I mean, when, I, you, when you're organizing this curriculum, Jim, I know mm-hmm. that's uh, – do, do you all have input on that curriculum? Do you all talk about that? Do you, As a long, long hunter, do you see a gap that you can – you say, well, I think we should do this, or – yeah, I mean, I, I would think so. The The curriculum is split between quite a few different speakers, um, and I'm just happy to fill in throughout the weekend gotcha. where, where yeah. I feel there's yeah. a gap. And I think, you know, we spent, I don't know how many meetings we had since yeah. last last fall, um, up to this fall, working on refining the curriculum, uh-huh. getting feedback from the students last year. And with this big crowd, obviously, we're going to hopefully get every student to give us feedback and then um, work to refine that again to what to develop the best program possible right right well it's 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 a great idea man Mm -hmm. i mean i'm I'm surprised that uh i'm surprised that it 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 waited for jim to show up so it was in wisconsin yeah they had a prototype right and and this goes back quite a ways i mean when i was doing my undergrad at university of wisconsin uh, in uh, the wildlife ecology department i had a professor my major advisor um, I remember sitting in a 100 level wildlife management course and there's probably, you know, a picture of probably 80 students in there. And he asked the question, you know, it's something paraphrased, but you know, how many people in here hunt? And, you know, it's maybe 15, 20 students out of 80 that raise their hands. And, and not to date you, but how long ago was it? Uh, that was in, oh, 90, okay. 1990. Yeah. So, and then he asked the question, you know, again, paraphrasing, but, you know, how many people are against hunting? And like 10 or 15 students raise their hand. Uh-huh. You know? And this is a, you know, this is a 100 level course, a prereq, you know, for getting a wildlife ecology degree where, yeah. you know, and these are for your future wildlife managers. Yeah. And I remember sitting in his office afterwards and, you know, just talking to him about, it and, you know, I could just see his fear, you know, and, and yeah. you know, he was just concerned that this is the future of wildlife managers. Right. You know, that they, not only were they not hunting, you know, some of them were actually, you know, actively opposed. self-acclaiming that they were opposed. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And so the, and that was, so over the next couple of years after that, um, that this professor started a program within, you know, the wildlife department where he'd invite, you know, students to hunt. You know, and with those students, um, you know, my, my, actually my college roommate's wife was one of the first students in that. And, you know, she did not grow up hunting and, she got really excited about going through the program and learn to hunt. Yeah. And um, so my college roommate and his wife and I hunted many, many times over the years and stuff. We, we'd always go back to this program that got Sonia, you know, got, gotcha. got yep. my college roommate's wife hunting and just the type of impact it had on her. Yeah. Um, so, so it does go back quite a ways, but in the more recent times in Wisconsin, um, you know, I mentioned Keith Warnke, you know, who was, yeah. who was a coordinator, yeah. you know, for the Wisconsin department of natural resources. And he started a program, and I can't remember the exact year, but, you know, it's within the last five years. Yeah. And, you know, that ended up going out to some of the local um, campuses, you know, around Wisconsin. And they put it on curriculum, you know, so students were actually getting credit for it. You know, and, you know, a lot of them were going into some of the, you know, two-year colleges. Yeah. Um, but they were, he said, they did not have enough spots. He said it was just crazy how quickly they were filling up, uh-huh. you know, how much demand there was to, uh-huh. you know, how much interest. You know, and, and I kept in touch with him, you know, over the years and stuff. And like I said, you know, I contacted him again when I was looking at writing up this grant proposal. And he was, you know, excited about it. And, it, you know, obviously his experience, you know, helped me, you know, with, you know, the curriculum, the agenda. Right. Well, you know, no, there's, like there's no such thing as inventing a weed. Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, and, you know, they do, you know, some of those, you know, they do, you know, they do it a little bit different. You know, we stole, you know, I obviously I stole some, you know, quite a bit of the ideas and stuff. And they do actually do some, you know, hunting, you know, during the program, you yeah. know, things like that. And they've got it to the point where, 
um, they can get certified hunter ed via the program, you know, yeah. things like that. And oh, I got you. Yeah. Right. You know, so it's, you know, just another, but you know, I think you asked the question earlier, how many, or, or maybe it's the warden, how many students at hunter ed here? And it surprised me the number of students that raise their hand. You bet. You know, you know, yeah. So they're, you know, they, there is, they're actively looking, you know, to get into hunting, you know, mm-hmm. but again, it's, you know, I think, if we can help them lower some of those barriers to get into it, you know, I think it's great. So. Right, sure. And, and that's interesting that in a wildlife ecology deal there would be um, – I do understand, like, the love of wildlife, non-consumptive use of wildlife where people just love it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and But uh, that model in the world hasn't really proved out to be – to add up to long-term protection of wildlife, you know, mm-hmm. in the way that hunting has. Um, and I, I, I've, I've explained around a lot of that. Um, over the years, especially during the years of writing about wolves, mm. I was in with a lot of folks who were non hunters and they were wolf advocates and they were advocates of, of various, um, protections or whatever. And, um, I'm not, I, I'm not prejudiced against them. You know, God love them. they they love something, right? Uh, which is, ha- which is fine. But, um, they, they lacked a, they lacked a, a, an ecological approach to the, to the protection of wildlife long term. You know, where, where, um, as whoever said, you know, you tug on one strand of the net and the whole net moves. Mm-hmm. Well, that's true in politics. That's true in wildlife protection, environmental protection, as, as it is in, in nature, you know. And they lacked that. They were, they were pulling a thread that was alone, really. Mm-hmm. And it, ba- it, and it relied upon people loving non-game wildlife or game wild, or wildlife, wild game or whatever. They would never say the word game. They hated that. But they, they relies upon it enough people just loving it independent of the rest of their lives to to carry forward and it and it's it's it became fairly it's pretty thin gruel when spread over a population of 300 million people and it depended on everybody to love something as much as you do <laughs> without having various types of investment in it um i think I, I i've said this before my son said one time he said we this this is what we do i mean nobody really loves it like we do and it's because we're out there taking supper and taking a year's worth of meat sometime. And you just, you just are so grateful to that place. And they say the Aborigines, when a, per, a place is particularly good to them, will take a knife and open a vein and water, water the ground with blood. And that's their, that's their, propi- not propitiation either. It's not the, pro- it's, it's just grat- gratitude. And I totally understand that. And that that's that's what I, I was watching this this group that y'all got, and they're getting they get they're getting it. Um, and the game warden today, um, Quinn Kuka, right. she was so good and so enthusiastic and and such a kind of, she was kind of a friendly figure, you know. Um, I mean, you, you got a hell of a lineup, man. Good. I mean, these things are these things are. I appreciate your setting this up. Oh, I appreciate that as well, and yeah, I, you know. I, on, by, on behalf of all of us, right? Yeah, yeah. definitely. And it, it's amazing to me, you know, the, the people that are willing to come in and speak, you know, and spend their time doing things. You know, the you know we have two chefs that are here cooking all the meals for us. Yeah. Um, you know, the, we have butchers on standby, you know, for, you know, if and when we get a deer. Right, you sure. Know, and just things like that to me is just amazing, you know, yeah. that they're willing to come out and, you know, sort of stand you know, stand on hold until things happen right, you know, just, you for the, just for the experience and, you know, and, and for helping out, you know, you know, the students and participants of the program. So. Yeah. So you're, you're out of the Northern Bitterroot there is where you live. Correct. And then yeah. are, um, are you hunting rifle this year? I am. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm not sure where, cause yeah. both of my areas are on fire right Everything. now. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, anybody can, almost right. anybody can say that same right. thing. <laughs> I've never seen anything like yeah. it. My, our area is on fire too. Yeah. It's not technically closed, mm. um, but it's it's on fire. Yeah. And then if you go a little bit north of our area, it's on fire too. <laughs> so, uh, I'm, but but I, I I trust that by well into rifle season, right. the fires will be out. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. Um, I hunted that Bitterroot country before the two thousand fires. Okay. And then uh, I'm, I'm I've I've hoped to. That it's it, it's actually doing much better now too. The East Fork of the Bitterroots was a was a place I lived and worked and mm-hmm. and it's it it, it boy did it burn. Yeah. Holy smokes! <laughs> <laughs> and it, and it's okay now, you Good. know, in in a lot of ways. Yeah. I mean, yep. um, but yeah. So uh, 
y'all, Trey, I, we got to get your elk hunting story, man. I mean, <laughs> you ain't got to give us the specifics of, of, of place and date, but uh, I, uh, this obviously is not the first one you've taken with a bow, or it is? No, no, um, no, it wasn't. It was, however, uh, the first limited entry elk permit I've ever drawn. Gotcha. Uh, my dad and I put in as a party. Um, nearly 30 years of collective bonus points. Yeah. And uh, this was a lucky year. Um, and so we planned on putting most of our effort into archery season. Um, went in the day before, set up camp, um, got into a lot of elk. Um, it was the first time ever in my life that I've passed on legal bulls before. Uh-huh. And I, I, a part of me hated myself for that. I bet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I myself, I don't think I've ever done that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but Sunday afternoon, uh, after taking a nap in the shade, heard a bugle down below. So we went and checked out a, a likely area and it was just full of green meadows and wallows and, um, 15 there's minutes. water up in there even now. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah it's a, yeah. it's a fairly wet area, um, which is nice because the surrounding area is really dry. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of bulls concentrated in there before they move out and go to the low ground where the cows are. Um, yeah, heard a, a bugle down below us and we set up and, um, you know, my dad kind of set up in a spot where we assumed the bull was going to come in and like most elk do, he came around the backside and, um, came into 20 yards, but couldn't get a shot. He was head on. Um, I couldn't call at that point because he pinned me down right away. Yeah. Um, so he started barking, looking for that cow. And as soon as he started barking, my dad knew there was a bull there that he couldn't see. So he started cow calling and walked right out, uh, turned broadside at 15 yards um, had a minor deflection with my arrow, um, so I didn't make the greatest shot, um, but was able to recover him. Uh-huh. Um, it was, uh, you know, I was sick to my stomach seeing a slam dunk shot like that. Yeah. Um, on what did it hit? Hit liver, hit the last couple of ribs. Yeah. Um, and then he, he ran for 20 yards and then walked for 20 yards and, uh, stood there. He wasn't bleeding externally, but he was bleeding internally. Um, stood there for the longest time, uh, too far to get a shot. And I was afraid I was going to bump him if I tried to, try to get closer to him. Uh, he finally bedded down. And so we thought that was going to be it. And then he stood back up and started walking away. And so at that point it was starting to get dark and I was fearful that I was going to lose his pull since he wasn't bleeding externally. Yeah. Um, so took my boots off and just started creeping behind him. And I probably walked behind him for a half hour, 45 minutes between 20 and 40 yards away. Um, Finally, he walked out in a meadow and I was just sidestepping to get a, get a clean broadside shot and, uh, looked up and there were two other six point bulls staring at me right behind him <laughs> and, uh, they took All off right. and spooked him. And so I ran back down and got my dad and younger brother who was along with us and grabbed my backpack, got a drink of water, went back up to uh, last blood and, uh, looked down and he was 30 yards away staring up at us and walked into the dark timber. So at that point we decided to just back out. We'd come in the next morning and, uh, it was a long hike out, you know, sick to my stomach. I was afraid yeah. because he wasn't bleeding much that, and, uh, it was still warm. I was afraid I was going to lose him. Um, first right away in the morning, we just started doing a grid search, walked a uh, hundred yards. Um, I was at the bottom, dad was in the middle and little brother was on top. And then we, um, changed roles and started walking back the other way. And, uh, 40 yards from where we'd seen him the last night, he was, piled up dead and wow. you know the work began yeah um it had been pretty warm that night and rigor mortis had set in did um, y'all have a lot of smoke over there too you know for two days we yeah. had quite a bit but the third night it got super cold at night um, yeah it, it, it froze up there we had um, 37 degrees at my yeah. house that yeah. that in the time you're talking about mm-hmm. yeah and so that that cleared out um uh like I said, rigor mortis had set in, so we knew he'd been dead for a while. So we yeah. were afraid of meat spoilage in the neck and in the, the hindquarters. Um, and then on, on the underside where he was laying, um, luckily all of it was was good. And so it was a long couple of days of backpacking meat back to camp. Yeah. Um, but it's always nice to have that weight off your shoulders figuratively and literally at <laughs> yeah, the beginning no of the season. Yeah, really. Now you can do whatever you want. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. What are your plans? Are you going to whitetail hunter, mule deer hunter? Uh, you know, I'm a uh, I like elk, and so I'm going to stick with elk. My dad still has that permit. Uh-huh. Um, so I'm going gotcha. to So you got to help him now. Yeah, He's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think we're yeah. going to spend uh that whole week of around peak rut the 21st in yeah. there. Um hopefully you can get it done then. Um after that, you know, Sawyer and I had some pretty Pretty awesome adventures last year. Yeah. Um, for the first time ever, he 
I got a, a bull on the, the rifle scope and um, I gave him a couple seconds to... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was a little to and off for actually seeing a bull during to really collect season. himself before I uh, let him know that he needed to uh, put around in the chamber because this is going to happen fast. Yeah. Um, but you know, I think that's one thing that draws me to a program like this is seeing that excitement um, isn't always in the kill. You know, Hunter didn't or uh, sorry didn't really come from a traditional hunting family, um, and I like hunting with new hunters um, and. The only thing, the one thing I really remember about that day of getting on those two bulls is, uh, we were hiking out in the dark back to the truck and, um, to paraphrase, uh, because of an expletive, uh, sorry, was very excited. You can use <laughs> expletives on these. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think every, every, you know, 30 seconds in the dark, all I would hear was a sigh from Sawyer and that was so fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, but Jim, you got to leave. Yeah, I do. All right, so, man. Well, thanks a lot, dude. All right, sure appreciate thanks it. Thanks for so. what you're doing, man. You're you hit something good. All right, sure appreciate it. I'm glad glad you're out there doing it. All right, thank you. All right, see you, man. Yeah, I think uh, if I, if I'd had a mentor that was bow hunting successfully, bow hunting big bulls on the first weekend of the season stuff, I'd have probably killed a lot more elk in my. <laughs> I'm about about thirty eight percent or something. And uh, I think I could have done a lot better if I'd had run into you when I was 25. <laughs> <laughs> I never, I did, uh, elk hunting was a do-it-yourself project for me, although I lucked out and killed one the first year. And then that didn't happen again for a long time. That was because I managed a ranch where a bunch of them wintered. Yeah. And I had a, I had a, like a big old migration trail that went right there to our hay fields. And I, and they actually weren't, they weren't there, but there was a single doing something. And uh, I, I, boy, I thought I was, I was the shit. You know, I, I was like, yeah, I went up there and got one, knocked him down. Was that along the front as well? No, that was back in the Bitterroots. Okay. Yeah, I just, I was, uh, I was very cocky about it, and I didn't get another one for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when you decided to come, saw your back to this. Uh, so you, you got fascinated. You must have been nineteen, right, when you started doing this? Yeah, eighteen, nineteen. What drew you? And you you were interested in taking meat, right? Yeah, meat. But, um, I I really I, I had an appreciation for wildlife, and uh, I, it was pretty open. Even though I didn't grow up in a hunting family, my uncle hunted, and uh, I always admired a lot of his. They were like whitetail hunters, and 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 we were in Vermont. I was in Vermont, Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah whitetail. Um, hunted a lot of duck. Yeah, and. You know, I grew I grew up in a town of three thousand people, real rural. Um, and there, you know, a lot of family friends hunted, and it was just part of the culture. And um, I think I had a, you know, a little. I had a, I had some admiration for for it, and um, kind of always wished oh, I wish I could could do that. And uh, when you when I came west, it was like, well, I I can do this now. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. And so it was just just gave it a go and it was definitely i think it it takes a certain amount of gumption and I, probably a certain amount of stupidity for, for for to try to go figure this out yourself um right but I, you know i was i was thankful i did that it, um, so tell me what it was like to go uh did you go by yourself or did you have a friend my, my best friend and i went and uh did you bought it did you just go buy a rifle how'd, borrowed, you, how'd you deal with that borrowed a borrowed a friends uh um and yeah just and what'd you borrow uh, uh, Savage two seventy, right? Oh, yeah. Savage one ten, yeah. bolt action. Yep. Did you guys uh, split it? it? What? Split the rifle. Split the rifle. No, we just he, uh, one of our so different friend had a rifle, so we just he let us use it. Yeah, we carry it and take turns. Right. Split the rifle. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Was, <laughs> yeah. And see, I'm still learning new terminology. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> It's the most economical way of all. Yeah. Although it often ends friendships too. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, you know, we. Uh, so did you shoot this rifle over and over before yeah, we you go went out? And we we did do some target practice. I think that was probably the only thing we did right. Um, figured out uh, a unit that we had spent some time in. Uh, we we climbed some mountains there and yeah. done some alpine fishing. We're like, oh, this will be fun. And, uh, the first season we went in and looking back that we were up at 13,000 feet looking down at these big bulls crossing some snow fields that probably we shouldn't have been crossing. And, yeah. um, but that was looking, you know, as, as I so get you farther, saw them the first time, no, we saw tracks, uh -huh, we saw, gotcha. 
sign, um, but never saw him. And it wasn't until year three or four uh, when we were starting to figure out. And I remember the moment we had gone up and scouted the day before the season and was like, all right, this is where they should be in the morning and got up there. Uh, and sure enough, heard of elk and there's a bull there and it starts it, working. It, yeah, yeah. And that was, yeah. it, that was a, the, I think for me, it was about these little successes each year yeah. that made it a successful hunting yeah. season. Yeah. I, st- I still feel that like when it works, like, because it doesn't work no matter how well, you know, the place and stuff, you know, yeah. probably a majority of time, you know, on public land in the high country, whatever. And so I still feel like that. Like, like I like I've won the lottery Yes, chance favors the prepared mind, right? Or luck favors the prepared mind, but but you're holy smokes, there they are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, did you ever get discouraged, or was it just building on, building up to to you felt like you were making progress? I this certainly got discouraged. Yeah. I mean, it, it was beat me down, um, frustrated, and cussing up a storm about elk. But I, I think through all that. I did develop – it even helped me strengthen my appreciation for, for these animals and this process. And, you know, at a certain point, you're just in awe of, like, coming up on a, a big bull or a, some cows and all of a sudden they disappear and how does an 800-pound creature just right. vanish? Um, right. Yeah, I was, I was memorized and just fixated by these oh. animals. And that, yeah. yeah. That's, and that that's was, the word for sure. Yeah. That, that was through the frustration and everything that developed. yeah. yeah. It makes you think like how difficult it would be to be a, a caveman, you know, <laughs> and how skinny you'd be and like the like like it's like there's there's a point where you do connect like to an older person inside or an, an older DNA, you know. And I and, and all is what that's why they painted them on the walls of those yeah. caves, you know. They're like, Look at this, you know, think of this. Look at what they can do. I remember seeing one running through an aspen thicket. And this was in September, and I didn't know anything about bow hunting. I knew a lot about uh, rifle hunting for deer, and I'd killed an elk or two, but I, I just, September was something. I usually was too busy. I didn't hunt. Anyway, I saw this big bull. These two bulls were sparring, and another one, he kind of got wind of me, and he took off through this aspen thicket. And, yes, his horns were hitting some, but not very much. And what he did running through that looked absolutely impossible. I was like, you know. It was before I understood about proprioception, where in, when they're in velvet, they're so tender that they can feel a fly on the on the antlers. So at the tip of the horn, they can feel a fly land. And so over that time, they develop an idea exactly where that horn set is. And um, it's something else I learned over the time of, from doing a story on game farming and, and selling velvet. Um, but uh, they have, by the time those horns harden, they have an absolute perfect idea of where they are and that's how he ran through that aspen ticket that's how they do what they do it's incredibly advanced yeah you know and they're and you watch those muscles in their shoulders going up the talus or going up those snow fields and you just like holy smokes look at that you know look at that creature <laughs> i mean it's i don't know I, you're you you tied into something cool i mean you, you were telling me you're like a, a recreationist like a mountain biker and climber and all that stuff yeah and so so have i been you know and and the the intensity did you do all do you do all that or did yeah you, i mean you know? I, I did all that as well but i think the focus has always been on hunting yeah um just really in the off season of hunting yeah i think that's that happened to me yep. too although for years um that what climbing was was my focus in it but the the need we, we we talked about this on other podcasts. The need when I had a family, the need for that meat was um, it eclipse, and then the intensity of of coming to hunting in that way, it 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 did eclipse my other recreational pursuits. Um, still love to fish in the summer, but it it definitely eclipsed like like the other stuff I was doing, and and I was glad for that. I was I was I was happy with the intensity of hunting. Like you're, that story you just told, Trey. It was like like are you like like when you come out of that it's like leaving it's coming into another reality i mean you and you're successful to boot you know <laughs> which is but didn't when you were doing uh did y'all live on that cattle ranch uh there? no um my grandparents owned it we always lived in missoula but gotcha. worked on it yeah um weeknights and on the weekends and um, a lot of a lot of my my friends that ranch hard, only a few of them. There's one of them is a real big time international big game hunter. Mm-hmm. The other ones don't really hunt, and I and I, I know I, I think it's it's something to do with how busy you are all the time right. with the daily you know needs of a, of a bigger ranch. Yeah. 
Um, but I, that's why I was wondering when you told me mm-hmm. that. And a lot of time, it's it's the people who grew up around ranching or whatever, but but became these, you know, really powerful in the hunting. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a rural your rural ethic, and then married to some some concept of leisure time because if you spent all the time that we spend hunting and, and add it up to the, for the meat, it wouldn't it wouldn't dollar <laughs> out. Yeah. Sometimes it does. Yeah. If you kill over a big cow like on opening day, it's definitely <laughs> you know. But um, so what's what are, what's your plans now? Like like you well, you're you're gonna help your daddy with that elk. But how many have you gotten before? <laughs> I, I can't really say off the top of my head. Um, but you've been a successful elk hunter for a long time. Yeah, I mean I've been hunting for I'm 23. Um, started when I was 12. Yeah. Um, it honestly didn't come right away that I started killing elk. Yeah. Um, there's a learning curve. Um, even though I, I was, you know, from five years old and on, I was, I was always along with my dad, uh, called in my first bull for him when I was nine years old. Um, and so it, it didn't happen right away. I didn't shoot yeah. when I was 12 or 13. Yeah. Um, but I, I started, you know, putting the pieces of the puzzle together of being in that position, holding the weapon. And, uh, yeah. um, you know, I think once it clicked, I think the first one was the hardest, Mm-hmm. Um, but after that, things, uh, started to get, was an that idea with a bow as well? No, the first one was with rifle. Uh-huh. Um, you still rifle hunt? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I generally hold that weapon really doesn't matter to me very much. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm happy to hunt with any weapon. Uh, I think the emphasis of hunting should be put on, you know, where you're hunting. Mm-hmm. Um, in my case, public lands and, um, the animal you're, you're going after. It doesn't yeah. have to be a specific animal. Right. Um, but what does that mean to you? That it doesn't, you mean it doesn't have to be one specific, like, like a big bull or whatever? Yeah, not necessarily. Um, I think, uh, that's a tough question. That's it is like, a tough <laughs> question. Yeah. One, well, one of the things somebody was telling me, uh, in amongst the world of people who are ambivalent about hunting or if you, and you talk with them, uh, they say, well, I'm, I'm okay with meat hunting, but I just don't like the trophy hunt. Mm-hmm. And, um, I never, the, the, the people who say that, and I, I, and I understand what they're talking about. Um, they never understand the, they don't understand hunting for one thing. And they don't understand the intensity you have to bring to the study of landscape and wildlife to target, say one big animal yep. and then, and, and pass up others. Mm-hmm. And you do, and you, and you do that. And, uh, I don't think that can be explained it has to be experienced, you know, and, and so I just, that's what I was asking you. Yeah. There. Yeah. It's I think, all... I think something to be said along those lines that was brought up at the beginning of funding for sustainability is, uh, we had an ethics discussion and Jim led off with, uh, some statistics that, you know, 85% of Americans, um, are okay with hunting for meat, uh, but only around 30% are okay with hunting for trophy. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, you know, this drawing the line. And this... How many, how many for trophy? Uh, around 30%. Okay. Um, and you know, I think that's drawing a line in the sand it, that it's, it's one or the other, yep. but it can be parts of both. Oh, it, for me, it's totally both. Yeah. It's never, it's, they've never been separated. Mm-hmm. It's just that I need to meet more than I need <laughs> a, a trophy animal yep. at this yep. point in my life. Mm-hmm. You know, how about, what about you? What do you think about that? I mean, from my first elk, whether it's a cow or a bull, it's going to be a trophy yeah. in my mind. Right. Um, and you know, it's that, it, that's. I would hope for most hunters, the animal you kill is a trophy. Yeah. And you've, you've put that time in. and I, It I definitely that, feels that way to me. I mean, yeah. we're, we're cow elk hunters at the moment because we yep. need that, that meat, but it definitely feels that way. And I, that's where I think it goes back to that those percentages, and that's just – it's a, it's not a fine line, and it's a, a lack of understanding. Mm-hmm. Right, it is, and it's a, it's a lack of tra- – there's no way to – that one's a hard one to translate because I can imagine how that question is an- asked. Do you believe in trophy hunting, you know? Or, you know, like, like, the, like, you know, the Cecil the Lion brouhaha, right? <laughs> and the, and the, and people will say, oh, I don't like that, you know? And then, and you say, well, you know, what about, and you, you, you can't, you can't move them from the first emotional reaction. And, and, and most people, uh, we've talked about this in journalism a lot. You, there's, it's fairly easy to transmit one idea, but, but an associated, a, a, a directly associated idea is what I call the next dot. And then the next dot and the next dot. And then, and, and so you can't really move a reader to dot three. They just, they don't have the patience for it. Right. And, and that's the same with trophy hunting. How would you ever explain the intensity of what you, you were just yeah. doing to somebody who's never hunted at all? 
Yeah, I think I'd it, like to see it try. It, yeah, <laughs> but, exactly. You know, I mean, I mean, really and truly. Yeah, yeah. It, and it, it's understandable that you know people see you know uh, a picture on Facebook or they see antlers up on the wall, and that's that's their snapshot of what hunting is and right. what it represents. But they they don't understand the the blank space on the wall between those two trophies and what went in between the two antlers on the right, wall. Right, right. And yeah. the, and the weight of like like the intensity of the experience mm-hmm. that 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 mount may represent. It also may represent all kind of things, like a miss, like like you didn't find. I, I, I shot one when I was really young, one time with a forty a Marlin lever action forty four, which I wouldn't recommend really for whitetails, although it works in, in the right hands. I was not the right hands, and I didn't find that deer for uh, a few days, you know. But we actually found it by these these feral dogs kind of led us to it. I still have that. I certainly didn't mount it. It was a spike on one side and a three point on the other. But I, I'll never forget the the desperation that I experienced in looking for that animal when I was by myself and um, running at one point. I, I didn't know nothing about letting them bed down. Yeah, I could have known because I could have asked people. I hunted but with some people, but uh, that it, it's not a bad memory. Mm-hmm. It, it's part of the apprenticeship to 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 the life, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, I've actually never told that story, <laughs> but I, I, I went home and I was probably 13 and I drew out the deer and where I thought I had hit it in a notebook. And, um, I wasn't too far off. It just, that, that using the loads I had in that 44, it, it just, I, I didn't know enough about blood trail and, 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 and uh, had it been during broad daylight and, and not been right around Christmas at the shortest day of the year, I'd have found it. But I, that, there were several mistakes, ma- you know, <laughs> there were several mistakes made and I was making, right? Um, and so I, I kind of, uh, I look at that, I look at those horns, they're at my daddy's place now and I hadn't seen them in years, but I look at those horns and that, that experience is there, you know. I hope you don't ever have it. But it was, but it's still, it was still powerful. Right, you know. Um, so you've killed you killed a whitetail buck last year. Is that your first big game? I sort of. I you know hunted a whitetail doe with my uncle, but um, questionable. You know, before I really knew about hunting and right when you were when you were really little. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was my first big game animal, and hopefully not my last. No, it won't be your last. Yeah, <laughs> well, look at look at who you're following around. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Huh. It was well, uh, quite the experience, you know, going in that day, and uh, um, we'd gone in the day before in the same area and yeah. got on bucks, and uh, I love the emotion, m- emotional release that happens within new hunters, and, you know, I saw that within Sawyer's, there was this young whitetail chasing a doe, yeah. and he couldn't be further than 20 yards away, but he was so fixated on that doe that... Uh, he wouldn't stop. I would whistle and just short of screaming at him, he wouldn't stop. And, yeah. you know, I turned to Sawyer afterwards and I was like, sorry, I couldn't get him to stop. And he was shaking and he's like, I don't think I could have shot anyways. Right. It's just so and, exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, uh, yeah, I think it was the next day or a few days later, we went back in there and, um, uh, I think that was the third buck we saw that day. Um, so made a great shot and instinctively, uh, as soon as he shot, I saw the impact. And so I ran ahead of him just to get a, a last look before he dove into the, yeah into the brush. And I remember saying, you got him. And so I goes, I got myself too. And I didn't think anything of it until I got up and I found that buck. And I turned around and Sawyer was just drenched, soaked in blood all over his face. <laughs> oh, you got, and you got a, yeah, you got a little <laughs> scar, I think. We, we sent the picture to Land too. And, uh, Land, Land sent a text back that, he really appreciated that. That uh, you know, his father always rubbed the blood of the kill on his, right. on his forehead. And he I was didn't like, have that. Yeah, so, like so that's not what happened. Later. He's, ima- yeah. he's imagining me up there rubbing blood on Sawyer's yeah. forehead. But hey, well, hell, we didn't even need that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's awesome. What right. are you? What, what were you shooting? What um, I shoot a, a Weatherby Vanguard thirty out six. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's a that's an awesome choice. Yeah, just yeah. a classic. And yeah, my son classic. recently spurned all my. Stuff and bought his own alt six, and it it, it is it is it, you can't go. What uh, Ernest Hemingway and uh, he he said that alt six took every bit every African game short of elephant, but um I can't remember. I think it was uh, Colonel Plaster, the the uh, the author of the it's a it's a manual for snipers. You can see it. It's a huge book. And Colonel Plaster says the thirty alt six is never a mistake. <laughs> you know. 
Now, how about you? What do you shoot? Uh, you know, I think the same. I started out with my dad's thirty out six. Killed my first elk with that. Yeah. Um, uh, I've since moved into. Uh, I really like backpacking for elk. Yeah. Um, so I wanted a lighter and shorter. Uh, so now I shoot a three hundred short action ultra mag. Gotcha. Um, I really like it. It's a manageable recoil. Yeah. Um, it's super yeah. light. Yeah, super light, right. super short. It's you know set uh, almost like a youth or a woman's rifle. Yeah. And so it, it packs really well. Yeah. Yeah. We have a model seven that my daughter shoots. Yep. It's like that. Yep. It is so tiny. And it and it it's totally lethal equipment. I mean, it's just a, I've killed. I've, it's just a slammer. Mm-hmm. But um, it's a it's a tiny thing. You know? Yep. 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 My uh, I had to put brother. a big cheek pad on it. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's 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 too low. But mm-hmm. but other than that, it's 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 great. Yeah. Go I mean, ahead, it, I it works. Yeah. No worries. Uh, it works well for you know my younger brother who was twelve last year's first hunting season. Um, mm-hmm. shot three big game animals with it. So. Uh, cool. <laughs> Do y'all antelope hunt too? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, this year we actually drew a party uh rifle antelope tags um for over here on the front so i'm excited for that i love archery hunting for them but uh i think the most fun you can have hunting is for antelope when you have a rifle in hand i do too when there's not too many other people (laughs) right right. them. yeah are (laughs) you do you antelope hunt sawyer yeah i do and we're actually just over in your area before we're coming up here we came up to augusta uh and camped out and uh uh was it yesterday morning would have been yeah went out and put a stock on some antelope and uh it was kind of fun Trey, yeah, we had a few other friends with us, and uh, Trey had a decoy, and I had a little costume, and yeah. got two to come in within seventy yards. Um, but couldn't why well, I pulled far. up? I was cutting firewood, and I pulled up on somebody. They were putting a spot and stalk on a on a buck, a lone buck, and that we couldn't have been y'all. This was last week. Not nah, no, nah. okay, because I they had a they had a um they had a BHA. <laughs> Uh, license plate or sticker, no, sticker or something. yeah, yeah. Okay. and I, th- I thought sure i would know them but i didn't <laughs> and they i thought they were broken down mm-hmm. and uh, i pulled over and talked to him and he goes my buddy's down there he had a spot and scope he was watching the whole action unfold <laughs> you know and they didn't get it oh too um, bad. yeah it's, yeah it's hard but and i, I had the, i had like a rancher like a working man persona i was like well some of us gotta cut wood we can't go out there just <laughs> walking around on the prairie <laughs> yeah <laughs> and in real life what i was wishing was i was out there like spotting stalking right. that buck i'd seen him cross the road you know <laughs> but yeah and, uh, i i i've had lots of people i i felt that i was doing that that's uh that's what the guy thought i was stopping for you know like to give them tr- give them grief <laughs> what are y'all doing? Is that public land? And it is. It's a, it's a series of state sections. Yeah. But I was like, yeah, I'm, I had a guy tell me one time I was hunting mule deer uh, way out in eastern Montana. And he, he said, yeah, you can go up there. There's nobody hunting it right now. I'm too busy to hunt. You know, <laughs> I hadn't been hunting. I hadn't been hunting since like 1979. And I was like, okay, I got you. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you should pick it back up. Yeah. You know, but you'll be happier. You seem kind of grim. <laughs> So what's next? You're you're gonna rifle hunt this year? Yeah. You got I, any special tags? Um drew an antelope bee tag. Awesome. Uh, so I'm excited about that. What uh, where is that? Down Big Hole. Yep. So yep. that'll be fun. Uh wanna go try to um chase some sage grouse. Yep. Um got a young bird dog, so a lot of work with him and then yeah, yeah obviously um, I think most of my focus we put on uh put on elk. Yeah. Make that happen. Yeah, but. for sure. That should be a f- fun I, year. Yeah, it should be a fun year. I'm trying to get out. I've got a job through October, and then I'm going to try to take November and go to the back country. And we're trying to do. Uh, I have to piggyback on with people with horses for the wilderness hunt. And for years, I've I've done it on foot, and then I'm getting addicted to this <laughs> piggybacking with other people on the horses. Yeah. Do y'all you you do all your stuff on foot, Trey? Yeah. Yeah. Um. I would I, think with that ranch, I'd have a big old string <laughs> of mules out you know, there, yeah, man. You know, even then, uh, it's not uh, ranch isn't in my family's uh, name anymore. But gotcha. um, even then, I think we mostly hunted on foot. I yeah. can hardly remember any times that we actually used horses to get game out. Yeah. Um, I like hunting, you know, simply. Yeah. Um, and so just being on foot and being light. Um, yeah, I hear it you. Takes a, it takes a lot of work to work with stock. It does. Uh, it takes up a lot of time that you could be it does. You know, hunting. It does. I, I've never skied any less than when a, my skiing partner, backcountry skiing partner, bought us a couple of snowmobiles so that mm. we could go to the great <laughs> stuff. Yeah. And it, we became snowmobile mechanics and people put <laughs> pull snowmobiles out of drifts. And I can't, I don't think I've ever skied less in a season than the year that we had, we thought that was, you know, yeah. it's the same thing with horses. I just, uh, 
But I, I'm uh, I packed a lot of elk out on foot, and I certainly love seeing that mule coming down the trail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, some people love they they just they're my son's like this. He's up. He's been packing, and they just love they love the horses and the mules. It's like people who love to hunt birds with dogs, and they they. They work in the dogs is is as important to them as any part of the hunt. You know, a good packer is the same. They may be a great hunter, yeah. But they're you will if you get them in a conversation, it'll be horses, mules, not so much tack, not so much pack saddle. It'll be the personalities of the horses and mules. You know, uh, what dog you got? I got a year and a half old German short hair pointer. Cool. Um, and he's uh, oh, that's your dog out there. Yeah, I like so That's my dog. What's out his there? name? Moshup. Moship, yeah. yeah, and he's uh, he's a handful. We're uh, we got a little bit of the season in last year, but this will be a first full season. I know. He's uh, chasing birds a little more than I'd like right now, but we'll we'll get that. That's I'm, maturity. I still got that that lab I got right there. I'll get up under a sharp. I, this is a true story. And he he hunts. He his flaw, and I'm sure it's mine, is that he will hunt for himself. And and he does enjoy and 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 he'll have just as good a time, and he does well with retrieving. But but a few years ago, a couple last year, when he was supposed to be five years old and perfect, and he's not. Um, he ran. We post hole through this snow into this up and game bird enhancement program deal mm-hmm. up in, in in northeast northeast of here, and uh, we you could see the. Rush, there were some Russian olives left over from the old days, but there was also a bunch of like rows and all this stuff. And we post hole through that, and there was sharp tails all over the place. They were actually down in the snow. And uh, he just got on top of the crust <laughs> and he ran out there about 250 yards, and you could hear him and dozens. And then he came back. Like ecstatic <laughs> after they were all gone, <laughs> all gone. Yeah. We couldn't get anywhere near him. We were we were post holing in there trying to get out of there, and, uh, and he was totally. We 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 held ourselves back from brutalizing him, or you know, almost or, or killing him. We would never do that, but we held ourselves back. But the dogs, the dog's happiness was just sickening. I mean, he was he was ecstatic. He was like he was like we. I, I really got up there and got on him. But, <laughs> He goes, you know, y'all, we can go back to the truck now. Too it's bad you could have been there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't believe what you missed. There were dozens of them. <laughs> so hopefully you can get him get him somewhere beyond that, you know. Well, hopefully, yeah. Well, I y'all, know. I know it's it's getting about 10 after 6, and y'all are going to – tell me what y'all are doing. Well, we've been trying to uh, find a white-tailed doe to uh, show the process of tracking and, you know, butchering uh, a deer. Right. Um, but unfortunately – To this class. That we've to this been class, about. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it worked out for him last year that yeah. uh, the local pastor came out on Saturday morning and was able to shoot a doe. And cool. We've had uh, three guys out there for the past couple of days trying to get it done, but unfortunately it's turned out that it's uh, it's hunting yeah. and it uh, <laughs> hasn't quite yeah. panned out. i uh, been super close to quite a few deer, um, so it's still looking likely. Yeah, well, yeah. if you got you got some time. Yeah. It's this, These conditions, I mean, it, was the heat a con- was, a, was a factor where y'all were hunting at all, or is the whitetail still out doing their thing? I mean, it's all down in the river bottom, so there's quite a bit of shade. Yeah. Um, we've been focusing just super early and super late, and then during the class or during the day, instructing the class, um, sneaking out when we can, and trying to get after them in their bedding areas. Yeah. But, Are um, you taking the class out on stalk at all? Like, like is anybody that far advanced? No, we're just. I, I think. No, I mean the short answer is no. We we um we want to get the animal down, yeah. And then there's just too many kids, and yeah. Uh, once we get it down, we'll bring them down. And last year we we coached them through, and they did all the gutting and field dressing, and then cool. all the butchering with, um, and we processed a bunch of the meat. So I think that's that's the aspect. Perhaps the stocking could be another another iteration. Right, that have to road. be done on a smaller scale, <laughs> right. man. Yeah. 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 But I mean, that's, you know, there is, as we were talking about earlier, there's, we're, we're constantly trying to build and improve this program, yeah. um, you know, within BHA's collegiate program. And I think, uh, there's, it, we're working with the Fish and Wildlife Service a lot on this. And, yeah. and they told us, I think there's between 250 and 350 of these similar kind of intro to hunter programs. Yeah. Yes. And so part of it is we have this foundation. And I think Trey's going to, work on this is trying to find the best parts of those programs across the country and so that we can really develop right the best programs is there any organ of uh, umbrella organization that that handles this kind of thing so i think or 
like like is there an organization of, of, of an umbrella that says like the organization of uh of sustainability hunting classes or no, not that i'm aware of yeah i think what we're going to do is the b so our our collegiate program which um we, bha started two years ago yeah uh I, land had this vision of bha is this really young energetic crowd why don't, it is yeah yeah and I, um, why don't we, why don't we try to engage with college students? So yeah. I, I was fortunate enough to come on board and, um, started at the university of Montana, built a club there, you know, similar to Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Ducks Unlimited, Trout Unlimited, they all have clubs, uh, yeah. wildlife society. And we kind of went off that, uh, built our club and it's, it's blown up and we expanded to Montana state, uh, university of Idaho, university of Wyoming, Colorado state, Western state, Colorado. Wow. And then, those were the kind of the schools I was targeting. Yeah. Um, and I've been absolutely floored a lot of through, uh, Steven Ranella's podcast, Randy Newberg's podcast. A lot of people have been hearing about BHA, yeah. a lot of college students. And so I'm getting emails, uh, from students all over the country. Uh, we, we've got, I uh, had a, got an email from a student at St. John's in Manhattan. Oh yeah. In yeah. the city. He wants yep. to start a club. Uh, we've got some Auburn, Kennesaw state down in the Southeast, University, University one, of Nevada, that's, Reno. That's one of that's that's one of Nevada would have the immense public lands. You know, um, Kennesaw and Georgia would be that would be really interesting to see who who is in, involved and interested to to study there. University of Alabama, where I went in Tuscaloosa, um, the the old hunting culture there it's it's narrowed down. You know, and I know there's people that are interested in the South. And you and and that could be another another active another constituency for for eastern public lands, right? Um, I mean, I just I, I don't know. I mean, I was, I'm pretty excited about what y'all are talking about. I think it's, uh, it is it's totally new to me, right? Like like I showed up today, and and uh, you and I talked on email or something, but it, it's I'm I'm I mean I'm still like really going like holy smokes, look at this, you know? Which yeah. I think, which, which I which, which, and I say like, wow, where does that go? Right? It goes a it yeah. goes a long way. Yeah, I think as it stands right now, we have um, student uh, BHA members at over forty different schools. Yeah, um, there's probably a lot we don't know about too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so of the states that he mentioned, we have around ten established clubs and just as many, you know, in the process of being established. And that's just, you yeah. know, that's within the last year and a half, two years. And so that's it's cool. grown pretty fast. Yeah. yeah, it's like every week we're we're getting another email of interest. A student wants to start a club, and so it's it's incredibly exciting. But it's also I don't think we expected it to grow at right. this exponential rate. And um, we're like we're we're trying to you know, we're reaching capacity almost. There's only two of us running this, and right. Trey just came on board. And so, well, it's somewhere you know, you pick up you picked up a power line or whatever you call it, whatever you know whatever metaphor works because um as Jim was talking about, it's like taking responsibility for your own role as a carnivore. You know that's one demographic. Locavore clean meat world that's another big demographic. Um, the foodie culture, and they're somewhat married, right, integrated, and then people who are seeking that intensity of of hunting, yeah, you know, like like I just I don't I'm, I'm not anti video games. I'm not a curmudgeon. I mean, I I'll, I'll take whatever technology. I was a video game freak when you had to pay a twenty five yeah. cents to pay play to play them, <laughs> and uh, um, all of that. I, I don't I don't say nothing that no to none of that, you know. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't think that has the that doesn't ha- can't touch. I was about to use a, a very vulgar <laughs> phrase, but it cannot touch the intensity of regular hunting. Uh-uh. I just I just came back from sharp tail hunting over dogs with other people's dogs. Mine didn't go, and it I just I, I was just blown. Away. I was lost in that. Hours would pass following those dogs. There weren't a hell of a lot of birds, but there was enough. Hours would pass, and you're just like. You're looking at those hathorns and those those buffalo berries, a big buffalo berry crop this year, choke cherry, all of that, and you're like, they could, I think they're going to be here. And damn if they weren't, right? And they're just like, and this this laser, like you're, it's like hyper reality. Definitely, I, yeah. I th- I mean, I think that's one of sorry, Trey. That's one of the parts we've got. We uh, we want to convey that to these to our club members and right. i think there's the kind of three pillars we've been working at and 
with their club programs. First is kind of getting those who are already hunting fish to to um, kind of go go that step for, for, for further and uh, become conservationists. Right. You know, be as, civically as Jim, engaged. Yeah, civically yeah. engaged. Participate. Mm-hmm. Protect yeah. the resource. Yeah. Um, and then the the second, which this program, Hunting for Sustainability, addresses, is to provide opportunities for students who have never had the opportunity, break down right. the learning curve, cost of entry, give them a foundation so that they can become um, hunters and anglers and do it under that guise of our BHA mission values, strong right. ethics. Right. And we, we really trying to hit that hard this week. And then the third, I think is just connect. BHA is an awesome community. Yeah. Um, I've yeah, met so fun. many incredible yeah. people. And so just yeah. growing that community and um, we're all looking out for each other. And so, right. Trey, you got anything to, to close us with, with fast wisdom from, uh, from the kill? Sawyer just stole what I was going to say. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's uh, it's looking good. I'll tell you, it's looking good. I mean, I mean, I I was just I was just watching that group y'all got here, and it, it there it's a, it's there's a lot of power, a lot of, like a lot of vibrancy. You know, people are people are engaged. Definitely, and, it's, and uh, I'm 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 proud to see it, man. I mean, it's it's a uh, I've been doing this. I, I never even thought about it. I, I've been hunting all my life without really. I never questioned it, you know. And and it's I enjoy talking to people who do question it and then come back to it or or stay questioning. I don't care. Yeah, I think um, something that I've noticed, um, and maybe you can speak more to this, but you know, I I have the small snapshot of when I started hunting and what hunting looked like to me, and uh, I didn't really understand or see beyond just trying to literally step in my dad's footprints in the snow. Um, but I think I see the face of hunting changing right now. Um, and so it's really important for, you know, myself and being a part of BHA is, um, kind of fostering that movement. Um, I think, and like I said, maybe you can speak to this as, you know, historically hunters were traditional hunters. They grew up in a family of right. hunters and so they became hunters. And now we have a lot of people who didn't grow up in hunting families, right. but they want to begin hunting. Yep. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Um, yeah, I do too. And I, I think, and, and uh, the single mother thing just showed up as, as being very significant, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it's a mother who may have been exposed to hunting as a young person and wants to try to pass that on to their children. And doesn't have a mentor. Is when that's just a fact of our society right now, and and we have to recognize that and provide that something positive for that, you know. And um, like I said, I, I never questioned it. It was easy to get into. Um, now I'm kind of like the old codger, the the you know you know what I mean, like the the, the ones that everybody's like used to teach hunters hunter safety. Mm-hmm. And um, it's great to have younger people coming into it as well that understand that because. You, you cannot, and, and no, I tell you what, no, no big time hunters that are really committed, I know, are curmudgeons about any of this. Like, they're locavores. <laughs> you know, people are really into it. They're really, they don't, they don't, they're not, they're not haters mm-hmm. of anybody. They're like, if you're, if you're ready, to, if you want it, if you, you're, then you're, you're okay, you know? Um, I do, I do think there's a lot of room for the, the hunting and marksmanship because that's a longer term commitment. Mm-hmm. That, that people need to like be cognizant of if you're hunting. I mean, to me, marksmanship is conservation, you know, and respect for game. And I, and I, I always want people to be, I, I'm a gun nut, you know, I always have been. That was another thing nobody questioned, you know, all the guns in the corner of my room. I'm nine <laughs> years old, you know, and there, this is your granddaddy's shotgun, you know. You find his pistol after he died in a, go- a Dodge Golden Edition 64. And he goes, you, you can have that, son. You know, this is your granddaddy's pistol. And so I, I never, but, but, but the people who are coming into this now, y'all may be the same. Uh, they, you know, they don't, they don't come from that, that world where, where guns were, co- not only, did, I don't talk about gun culture, the guns were part of your culture. And, mm-hmm. and, and, um, guns are very important in hunting. And getting the right gun and being able to be proficient with it, you know. And I, I hope that I, I hope I hope that starts a whole new culture of responsibility where people say, I, I'm responsible for taking my meat and this is my tool. This is my weapon. Yeah. You know. And I'm good with it. You know, I'm I'm me me and this thing are are, are the same. Yeah. We're 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 out here to we're out here to do this humanely and quickly and, and sportsmanlike. 
So yeah, I think it's. You know, I didn't. I I didn't grow up with guns being part of my culture, and they knew. And I I've just started to go to the range a lot more and shoot, and it's it's it, developing a bond with my gun. And so I that it, and that's just part of the ethics. I you know, I've had these conversations with myself that I want to know. I pull that trigger that that animal's going down, and right. that's I. Th- have to figure out how to articulate that to the students, like um, mm-hmm. you know, new new hunters here. But that's, I think that's part of the progression of a, a hunter and a, a development. Right. So. Yeah, I do too. And I th- and I think that'll argue also for um, you know, like more more ranges too, like in the in the future for public land because that's a, it's a big restricting factor in Alabama. You know, and there's a lot of irresponsible like firearms use in Alabama on, on private land. You know, <laughs> you know, and it's and it's and it's it's a uh, the, the Pittman Robertson funds have an have an allocation mm-hmm. for you know shooting ranges and, and yeah. stuff like that. And I have a good buddy that teaches firearms, tactical firearms mostly. But I went to his range in Alabama when I bought my rifle, my three hundred eight, and I put about two hundred and fifty, three hundred through it under under his tutelage. You know, and um, when I walked away from there, I felt I felt like I had done my part to gain some proficiency. With that rifle, I'm still not. The <laughs> rifle still shoots better than I can shoot it, you know. But that was a blast as well, yeah. you know. So, well, fellas, I know you got to go try to hunt, um, and I don't. I do not want to mess that up. I oh, appreciate so, that. The lights waning, and <laughs> th- things are moving. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, we'll get an animal down here in a, in a little bit. Well, thanks a lot, boys. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate really it. Really enjoyed it, man. Thanks for taking the time to come out. Well, that's it's a great place to be. See ya. See ya.